150 million years ago, a creature called Archaeopteryx took to the skies. Part reptile, part bird, the creature had teeth, solid bones, and reptilian claws. But it had something else, too. Archaeopteryx had feathers. Over the next 75 million years, feathers and flight improved. Birds lost their teeth, and most grew hollow bones, which reduced weight and made flight easier. Flight may have evolved to help birds escape predators, catch fast prey, or to make it easier to move from place to place. No one really knows. One thing is certain. All 8,700 species of modern birds have feathers. Made of keratin, the same protein found in hair, feathers apparently evolved from the scales of reptilian ancestors. A typical bird of prey has over 7,000 feathers. Small, light feathers, refined for flight, help eagles catch air. But even flightless birds have feathers. Penguins pack 70 stiff feathers in a square inch. These feathers provide waterproofing and cover an insulating layer of blubber. Feather colors are usually provided by different pigments. Black, gray, and brown birds have melanin to thank for their color. Scarlet ibises owe this splashy red to the carotene found in the shrimp and other crustaceans they eat. All feathered creatures lay eggs too. But nest building styles range from simple to elaborate. The young of some birds, like ducks, are precocial, able to feed themselves as soon as they're born. Other young birds, like this albatross, are altricial and must wait to be fed by parents. The search for food takes many birds on annual migrations. Hummingbirds may fly hundreds of miles from nesting sites as far north as Washington State to wintering grounds in Mexico making the trip to and from each year. Such bold, adaptive skills have allowed birds to find homes in most habitats on Earth. Early human attempts to follow birds into the air were rewarded with disappointment and disaster. People just aren't built to fly. Though wings evolved from a set of arm bones very much like our own, birds took off in a very different structural direction. Ken Dial at the University of Montana is studying the fine points of flight. Okay. Three. One, two, three. So here, if we look through this bird, wipe off the wings, wipe off the skin, peel away the muscles, well, what are we left with? The skeletal elements of the forelimbs or the wings. Well, we have these same bones. What's different about it is the distal part of the wing here, the skeletal apparatus, have fused over time. Birds don't need fingers to fly. What they do need is muscles. The muscles that are developing the force that permit these birds to fly are right here, the pectoralis muscles. You and I own these muscles, but quite frankly, I think personal, they're, they're quite wimpy. If I were scaled to the size of a bird, I would have a keel to my sternum here. And this increases the surface area with which 
the pectoralis muscle can attach. In fact, it might even extend on another foot. The problem with this design is that now I've put all of this mass forward and I'm tending to tip over. You'd be holding this weight out here. It's like you're holding groceries here. Mother Nature's done a very clever thing, and that's allowed the sternum, the keel of the sternum, to slide down between the legs of a bird. This is very ingenious. And so birds actually have their breast muscles attached here to beat their wings. For a real show of strength, look no further than the hummingbird. Other birds get their wing power from the downstroke alone. Hummingbirds have strength on the upstroke as well. They fly right, left, up, down, and backwards. To fuel their high performance engines, Hummingbirds may eat an amount of food equal to two-thirds of their body weight in a single day. Their hearts race, they breathe fast, and their body temperature runs high. Not all birds are designed for such precision flying. Albatrosses have sacrificed some maneuverability for the ability to glide. Long, narrow wings keep these birds aloft for hours over open ocean without having to beat their wings. But takeoffs and landings are a little tricky. Young albatrosses have to practice on land long before heading out to sea where they will spend most of their lives. They come back to land only to breed. It's an illusion that birds are, are, are delicate and fragile and, uh, and weak because what they really are are muscle bound and hidden by feathers is this fantastic flying machinery of muscles. For any bird of prey, the first year of life proves the toughest. Golden eagles living in the western highlands of Scotland are no exception. Only half of these young birds survive. Ten-week-old eagles, left by their parents to fend for themselves, must get up the courage to fly, hunt and search for territory to call their own, or they'll die. Zoologist Mike McGrady has spent years following young golden eagles after they leave their nests. He uses tracking devices to monitor their movements. For the first few months after it leaves the nest, it's, it uh, is resident on its, its natal territory. But after, in usually well, November through January, they, they move on and start to wander quite widely. These these wanderings can be over hundreds of, of kilometers and they don't seem to have any direction. Catching birds on long random courses through the highlands requires patience, skill, luck, and a free meal. McGrady baits his eagle trap with a rabbit and then he sits in a blind and waits and waits and waits six days later he sees an eagle overhead and hopes it's hungry once the eagle is in, in, in position we just fire the trap by uh, radio control this bird's in the right place but springing the trap now might injure its open wings. At last, the moment arrives. The first tasks are to tag the bird and take measurements. With its relatively short beak and talons, this bird is a male. Females are larger, an adaptation that may help protect them from more aggressive males. 
Before releasing the bird, McGrady and his colleagues outfit it with a lightweight radio transmitter. I tried to choose a feather that's, that's relatively new because eagles don't, don't molt through all their feathers in one particular year. So hopefully this bird will be able to, to keep the transmitter on at least as long as the life of the transmitter, which might be about two years. To be successful, young male golden eagles need to claim territories. But the best places are usually taken. McGrady's research has shown him that eagles occasionally fight to the death in order to secure a home, hunting grounds, and a mate. One tagged male disappeared after transmitting information on his whereabouts over 18 months. A static signal finally led McGrady to his remains. Once we cleaned up the, the skull, the whole skeleton, we, we, we sort of realized what, what had caused this, this bird to die. Um, it had obviously received a wound from probably another eagle. Must be another eagle. I can't imagine anything else inflicting a wound like that on an adult uh, golden eagle. The apparent victor claimed the territory some seven miles long, five miles wide, and a mate. But each year, territorial battles will be waged. Eagles, superior predators, face the greatest challenges from their own kind. In the heart of Peru's Manu Park, hundreds of gaudy macaws splash their color throughout the forest. The most colorful of all large parrots, macaws attracted the attention of Dr. Charles Munn, a zoologist for the Wildlife Conservation Society in 1984. The population of macaws in Manu is very high. You can see hundreds in one moment. Either at some of the root sites, and especially at the McCall Lakes, if you play lakes and riverbanks. All 18 species of macaws living in South American rainforests have been exported for the pet trade. The business has taken its toll. Today, 11 macaw species are considered endangered. And when I started to ask questions about the pet trade and whether the amount of macaws that were being taken out of the forest, whether those amounts were sustainable and justifiable, there, were, there was no information to answer the question. So I said, well, we better find out what macaws are doing in the wild before they're all gone. So that's when we started the research. Because Manu is home to seven macaw species, this part of the Amazonian rainforest proved an ideal place to study the birds. It's easy to find macaws. Their long tails are unique to this family of birds. And as many as 100 of them may perch on an eroding riverbank, biting off and swallowing chunks of clay. Just why macaws snack on clay isn't certain. But scientists believe the clay offsets the effects of a steady diet of bitter, unripe fruit and toxic seeds. From the clay licks, the Munns and native Machiganga researchers follow the birds home to nesting sites a hundred feet up. All parrots mate for life and, with few exceptions, nest in holes in trees. By periodically visiting the sites and taking measurements of growing birds, researchers are finally getting a picture of wild macaw reproduction. Probably the most important results of our studies uh, are the uh, results on reproductive rates and the cause because there was a lot of controversy about whether you could harvest them for the pet trade. And we found that a very small percentage of the population, of the adult population of macaws breed in any given year. So of a hundred 
uh, pairs of, of adult macaws, only about 12 to 25 youngsters are produced, depending on whether it's a high or low year. Guided by the research of Munn and his colleagues, the U.S. banned the import of wild tropical birds in 1993, though illegal trade still thrives. Mun and his Machigenga allies have also built artificial nests and hand-reared orphan chicks in an effort to boost the number of young produced each year. I study macaws because macaws are among the most spectacular and endangered species in this Amazonian ecosystem. And by protecting macaws and the habitats they live in, I'm protecting all the other species that live in this forest as well, but are just as deserving of protection, but perhaps less conspicuous or less spectacular. In all their guises, birds of prey share a few traits that set them apart from other birds. Strong, taloned feet and sharp, curved beaks make them all skillful hunters. But variations on this theme allow the birds to take advantage of different habitats and food sources. Owls own the night sky. In low light conditions, owls' eyesight is 100 times more sensitive than our own, and they hear better than any other bird. Biologist Roger Payne discovered just how well owls hear in an experiment back in 1957. I knew that owls had asymmetrical ears. The ears weren't the same on the two sides of the head. And that was curious. It meant ears were important to owls. I had to be doing something with them. So I put an owl on a perch in a darkened room, and I then released a mouse into leaves on the floor of the room. And the mouse, as it moved around, made noise, banging into the leaves and crushing them. And suddenly, in the darkness, the owl struck, and I turned on the lights, and it was holding the mouse. I just couldn't believe it. Extraordinary hearing enables owls to hunt in the dark. But at first glance, the birds appear to have no ears at all. They're hidden behind feathers next to the eye. The reason an owl looks like an owl is all to do with acoustic adaptations. In other words, adaptations for hearing. One of the most obvious ones is this circle of feathers around both sides of the head. Actually, this is one parabola to collect sound for this ear, and this is another parabola to collect sound for that ear, which is actually very much like cupping your hand behind your ear as a means of collecting more sound. Hawks, including kestrels and eagles, hunt during the day and rely on the best eyesight in the animal world to help them find prey. For hawks, kestrels have relatively small eyes, but kestrels can detect ultraviolet light, making it easy for them to see small mammals, even in thick grass. Voles process food quickly and leave a trail of waste as they move. Urine reflects ultraviolet light. Kestrels see a lighted trail to a meal from the air. But even ultraviolet vision doesn't guarantee a successful hunt. Vultures don't have to kill their food, they just have to find it. For the most part, vultures prey on the dead. And a turkey vulture's nose directs the search. Nostrils big enough for us to see through gather scent. Smells are analyzed by olfactory bulbs at the front of the brain. 
The sensitive bulbs identify the direction of the sense source. Turkey vultures often sniff out a meal before other vulture species. Once alerted, other vultures move in for a share. And that's just fine. Turkey vultures don't have an easy time tearing open skin. King vultures do, but they have a weaker sense of smell. Cooperation means everybody gets a meal. Keen senses of smell, sharp eyesight, and excellent hearing give birds of prey supremacy in the skies in every place on Earth except Antarctica.